Okay, everybody can see that okay? Yep, so the basic plan is that Phil, Pablo and myself are going to give a wee presentation about embedding open research and reproducibility in the curricula. It's a 20 minute-ish presentation where we pass from one to the other seamlessly, maybe. We've had one rehearsal, we got distracted halfway through and just started chatting to each other. So <laughs> we're basically going to wing it, I think is what I'm saying. Um, after this uh, little presentation, um, you're going to break into smaller breakout rooms. I'm going to, don't, you, don't you use the Google Doc, by the way. I've actually set up a HackMD document, which is actually linked from the Google Notes document. Uh, and you're going to work on a couple of challenges, which we're going to capture in that collaborative HackMD document. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. Okay. So we've developed a very intricate uh, system of hand signals. I'm recording, I'm controlling the slides. So if you see lots of strange hand signals in the background, uh, we know what they mean, maybe. Okay. So welcome everybody to the session. Oh, crikey, my, that's not working. There you go. So if you heard the, uh, my talk earlier, you'll be aware of the so-called replication crisis in psychology, which has caused a number of issues, uh, not just in how people conduct their research, but also in terms of how we think about, we teach research and research skills to our undergraduate and postgraduate students. So a lot of teachings have really started to sort of go back to basics and ask the fundamental question, are we teaching data analysis skills to our students correctly? And if not, how could we better be teaching them so that the students have a clear understanding of the importance of reproducibility, but also how they adopt reproducible practices in their own work uh, themselves. So over to Phil, if you'll need to unmute yourself. There we go, sorry. Um, does it sound okay? Yep. Okay, Andrew, I'm gonna go with the thumbs up approach. Okay, so to start off, I'll spend about a couple of minutes just explaining what we've done in Glasgow. And really, I'm going to focus on how we've built R into our teaching. We've done a bunch of other things as well in terms of reproducibility and psychology. So this is really focused on kind of how we've switched our kind of coding-based idea. So Dale Barr, when he joined us from UCI in about 2015, he was teaching level three statistics and it was really for about four years he was actually teaching it in both SPSS and in R through our studio and offering students whichever way they wanted to learn it best. Level one and level two, uh, probably should say Glasgow um, and all Scottish unis use a four-year program so level one and level two we were teaching SPSS and then level three he would offer them SPSS and R whichever they preferred to use. We ran a couple of kind of uh, would call it kind of a evaluation project on it. And there's a poster link available there to the slides. Um, it started to effectively show the students who chose to do the analysis in R actually got a better understanding of statistics and became a lot more confident in it. But what we did also see, which would be an issue if we permanently left the idea of teaching both, was that students tended to um, choose or less confident students would tend to choose SPSS because they thought it was easier to do. But that's to be like at the detriment of their own skill levels. So what we, after a kind of many discussions, a kind of our view of our whole system, decided to do was in about 2016, 2017, was just change all our undergrad program into R. Um, we also changed the postgrad teaching, but again, I just really focus on the undergrad teaching at the moment. There's kind of two key points that we kept principles to everything we did. The first really was just that R is just a tool we're using to teach the skills. It's not about the software per se, the software just allows us to do certain things. But we really identified skills that we wanted our students to do, have and we thought that they would need as modern psychologists in the field. And the second key point is really to be able to do that, we need to know what key skills we uh, value within our teaching. And these are things like reading in data, concatenating data, data wrangling, which some would really focus on, but also kind of more basic stuff like visualization skills, uh, visual literacy, and probability. Just things that we realized as students got to the final year project, they didn't actually know that well how to do it. They could do the analysis, but not the basics of the test and getting the data into correct shape. 
So the process we took um, in 2016, 2017, we effectively just started again with level one, completely revamped the curriculum to take a new whole open data approach, focusing all analysis in R through R Studio. And to do this, we use a kind of a sort of treat it like a language. The more you use it, the better you become idea. Where we'd run labs that had a pre-class activity, in-class activity, and a homework activity. Level two was a bit more complicated. They'd already had one year of SKSS, and then we're now introducing R. But we also had the issue of the staff not having the skills yet to fully teach the R that we need at that level. So we effectively just took the SKSS labs that we had and swapped them into R. Literally just took the analysis they were doing, the point and click basis of R, um, of SKSS, sorry. I just kind of did a copy and paste into R for people who strongly copy code over and just paste the code, or maybe sometimes they get a bit more complicated than that. And then level three, we solely offered R from that point onward. The year after that, we just updated level one, and then level two, we revamped the course entirely again at that stage because the level one had already some basis on it now. From there, and kind of to the current process, it's really just been a case of updating based on feedback, trying to make the courses more interactive, um, trying to kind of go from where we are in terms of coders, thinking back how someone actually learns this from the basics. What are the kind of issues that they keep coming up against and how do we actually fix those? So that's kind of what by updating. What that's allowed us to do is bring in additional courses within the, the um, whole curriculum, particularly now at level four, we can bring in courses like bootstrap and then advanced statistics with using linear models because the students all have the skills over three years now in terms of like data wrangling and bringing data in. We have obviously run open science for a few years now, so all our materials are available on our webpage there, which is link or through the Twitter handles like the SciStar handle. And this is just really a list of different kind of degrees. Um, there's probably loads more um, now online, but uh, kind of in terms of psychology. A whole bunch of places over the UK are now kind of either shifting their postgrad or shifting their undergrad to some degree at it, uh, into things like R and, and or Python and uh, other different softwares. So it's kind of like an idea of like, well, others are doing it, so what's the best way of doing this now? Um, but it's not easy, right? Um, but no one's ever going to lie to you and say this has been the most smoothest thing we've ever done in four years. But kind of a couple of key questions, things like with undergrad income being important when I think come just think of things like the NSS or the Guardian top 20 units those sorts of ideas it could be a bit risk averse risk, risk averse sorry when trying to update your program so when do you change the course and how do you deal with different skills across the years things like our level one having more advanced skills in our level two how do you deal with those issues other issues kind of like the delivering of the teaching may not have the time or confidence to radically change the curriculum can the students cope with what we're doing? And more also in terms of more personally, how will the teaching staff be able to cope with it? What do you do when you don't have the actual skills across your team to be able to run these kind of changes? Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, so there are a number of challenges that I think we've all faced um, uh, trying to encourage our various uh, departments and degree courses we teach on um, to adopt uh, uh, you know, ability either via R or some other sort of um, approach. And I guess the biggest challenge is really getting buy-in um, from the institution itself. You know, you need to have your senior academics who are going to support you. Um, universities don't really like taking risk. Um, certainly changing the way in which you teach data science and statistics is a potential high-risk endeavor because it may not work. Um, so you need to have that sort of support from your, from your senior colleagues to do that. And I guess there are also a set of challenges that are sort of more, more uh, pedagogical in nature. Um, people who've perhaps never done coding before, uh, people who maybe don't see why they need to learn to code in order to do a subject like psychology, say, they might think of coding as being a particular computer science -y thing rather than appreciating that it applies across the board. Um, and I guess there are also practical challenges as well. One of the biggest challenges I faced is when I've been teaching to students who are on a managed PC cluster where they're not able to install software themselves. Um, they may not even be able to uh, download, uh, you know, install packages either. So there are challenges associated with those sort of managed um, PC clusters, 
but also challenges associated with very sort of idiosyncratic setups uh, that some students um, might have on their, own, on their own laptops. But there are a number of things that have happened recently which have really helped us try to uh, address these challenges. Um, a lot of the sort of um, help has actually come from the research environment, which is uh, able to sort of feed into teaching because we know that many funders now encourage the adoption of open research practices. I guess welcome are probably the, the funder most at the forefront um, of this endeavour. Um, interestingly, REF is also rewarding open research now and many academics are suddenly realising they need to um, upskill in terms of acquiring these sorts of um, uh, coding skills. Uh, the UK Reproducibility Network is asking all institutions to appoint an open research uh, reproducibility lead who will sit on the university senior management team that's actually separate from the more grassroots open research working groups. Um, we also know there's uh, you know, pressure from journals now requiring, in many cases, uh, data and code to be published alongside uh, journal articles. Um, I'm basically now refusing to review journal articles where the data and code aren't available to me as a reviewer or will be made available to the readers once the article is actually published. And I think there's increasing recognition that coding skills are actually good from an employability point of view. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a real skill that students can take out there after their degree. And I, you know, I just want to say that Glasgow have done an absolutely phenomenal job over the last few years in terms of this move towards teaching reproducibility and coding skills to their psychology students. And I think last year I saw a tweet quite possibly from Phil about one of their recent graduates who got a job in data science um, because of their sort of R skills that they acquired during their psychology degree. Um, and it's also a great opportunity in terms of um, collaborative design of teaching content where you've got many people contributing to design in that teaching content so i think this is just to expand a little bit on some of the challenges we've faced over the past three four years um, a couple of the andrews already touched on but it's just to say a wee bit more about how we fit, cope with it i think one of the main ones particularly in psychology is students come into psychology not expecting to code and really from day one in the labs we're putting them in front of r and telling them this is how we're going to actually do some analysis from now on what we've tried to do over the years is really try and embed it in an idea of skill development and reproducible research skills um, and really kind of emphasize as that you're saying like what's the importance of these skills to them in terms of employability in four years time or three years time once they actually leave the degree it's also been really beneficial to us to have a methods um, lecture module that runs along with in kind of the same time frame as the lab series and in that you can kind of just reiterate all the points about kind of open science reproducible research but it kind of novel approaches like registered reports secondary data analysis that were kind of not really used in the past few years but are becoming more prominent and the main thing to always remember at least in psychology is the students have joined uni um, to become psychologists that's their chosen degree and i'm sure it's the same in biology chemistry and a bunch of other sciences and other courses so if you convince them that, or if you can convince them that these are the skills they need to become and what they want to be, then they will buy into it a bit more. Second main issue we kind of saw is when to change the program. Um, really, I'll tell you straight up, there's never been right. Uni doesn't stop as well. Just think about coronavirus. It, may, it might be stopping for three years, but you never know. But the uni doesn't really ever stop for a long period of time to allow you to actually just kind of wait till one cohort leaves and start a new cohort fresh again. So you're always going to have a, part, a problem or a point where cohorts are having different skills. How we dealt with that is we spent a lot of time convincing even the students who were perhaps delayed in their skills, they were still benefiting from this change, right? They were still going to leave us with an understanding of some level of data wrangling. It won't be as good as what students come up four years and they're behind them, but what they will learn would have been better what they would do than what they would have learned if they hadn't changed. Couple of last kind of points. What software to use is a great question. Um, at the moment, you've got a whole bunch of things. The SPSS is the old fashioned. Jamovi, Jasper, kind of new, new SPSS that are free, they're great jobs. And any of your things are much more line based coding like R, Python. 
Um, what I would say to that is it really depends on what skills you want your students to have, right? We valued reproducible data wrangling over analysis. So to us, R made more sense than a point and click approach. However, if you don't have the skills or across your teaching team or something like that, or you feel like all you really wanted was to give an idea or kind of a bridging gap between open reproducible research and what they are learning, things, things like Jamobi and Jack are doing a fantastic job at that. Doing it effectively, we found treating it like a language has really worked. Big kind of theme that we've run through our teaching is to keep the, um, the, the skills repetitive, right? The data is going to change, but the skills are going to stay, stay the same. So every lab, like I said, is a pre-class and in-class and a homework that uses exactly the same skills all the time, but just the data is changing. Okay, that's kind of a key point for one of ours as well. One other major issue we had was thinking about assignments. How can you actually assess code um, and what students are coding? Well, we had to write, uh, and then we had to develop an in-house package for that called Assessor, which can be used to assess code in our markdown, which Dale Barr has created. And it's available on GitHub as well. And I'm sure if you sat for five minutes, you'll think about a whole bunch of different questions. And that's really this last point about X, Y, and Z. We've kind of realized over the last three, four years that there's always going to be a solution no matter what you do. And in the long run, your students will benefit the most from it. And I think one of the things we've been talking about over the past week or two, really that better software allows better teaching um, to kind of plagiarize the SSI um, kind of hashtag there a little bit. But it's really true in the sense that it wasn't until we shifted to R that we realized the other gaps that were in our teaching. And it was only by having the facility and the availability to actually um, teach certain elements, we realized where we could really develop our students. And we've really seen a massive development in our students and where they've come on from. A couple other practical changes, sorry, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, university managed PC restrictions. We've been very fortunate to have a very strong IT support at Glasgow. So we have dedicated psychology labs that all use the same computer image. It saves a lot of hassle. Um, we've also encouraged students to use their own laptop where possible. So in level one, they tend to use our machines. By level two and onwards, they're starting to use their own laptops. But you still have issues like Chromebook isn't very good with R. I don't think it actually lets you use R at the moment. Um, students are perhaps not as computer literate as you might imagine. And you see issues with the basic kind of data arrangement, folder naming, all those sorts of things. So these are issues that you wouldn't have thought of, but you're actually going to have to find ways around. Um, the last point is really how to use the R Studio Cloud, which is um, just another approach to getting around these things. If you don't have the um, IT support available around you, you can use the R Studio Cloud, which is if IQ, can we move the slide on, Andrew? I can only yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was just going to say, so R oh, the R Studio Cloud opens on a browser, so it's a nice way to have uh, Chromebook users using R Studio yeah. just by doing it via the browser. So all the heavy lifting's done off their off their Chromebooks. I think we're on the next slide. Yeah, there exactly. So yeah, as Andrew said there, so cloud basically is just this nice browser technique and you can divert any kind of problems with Chromebook through it. And what Andrew was, I was saying he uses is kind of a Docker-based system where you can release all the packages that they need into the cloud that people can just download and utilize that way. Uh, one of our kind of GTAs set up a, a how-to on using the RStudio Cloud, which is available there if people want to try it. The only issue that you, or well, one of the issues you might have if you use the cloud approach is that eventually students will have to learn how to use it on their own laptop and they may face the same issues um, at that point that you would have seen in earlier on had you just kind of bit the bullet and used their own laptop from the get-go. And that's kind of just some of the issues we faced, but I'm sure you'll be able to think of others. Hey, Pablo. All right, uh, sorry, yeah. So thinking about the uptake of programming to facilitate reproducibility in psychology or any other disciplines. Uh, one, I will divide it into voluntary and mandatory. So there are requirements, they, there can be requirements, uh, there can be allowances also, so there's nothing goes ahead without policy, right? Uh, although the grassroots can be powerful. I think, um, and so what happens if a student, a uh, bachelor, or so master's student wants to do a PhD um, and wants to apply reproducibility, the, the in degree, something contributing to that very largely, which is 
for instance, programming in R has not yet been applied. Now there are two alternatives. Either the student puts in extra time of their own and studies outside of their own degree, extracurricular courses, or, um, or they do not. And this is dictated by the economic resources of the student. So policy and uh, watch for a blog post coming up with Francis Cooper, who is around and other colleagues with whom I was just talking. And another colleague, Yastemine, uh, from the Netherlands, from Delft University, was telling us that there they've implemented a voluntary so that the student can tailor their own curriculum to embed, say, programming. So these are just ideas. Now, there are time constraints, uh, working time, uh, allowed or not allowed for skill development. This is after graduation, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, professional rewards um, or the lack thereof and personal priorities. Now, all of this gets exaggerated after graduation. So because you are more dictated by a department, etc. So it's, I think it's great to embed this in curriculum in curricula because uh, you you get rid of all these possibilities for not implementing reproducibility and and programming. Um, so preempting future blockers. Uh, now thinking about collaboration, uh, I've had the experience to contribute to uh, a, a, a course teaching our studio and statistics. And uh, I've realized the power of the synergy created in collaboration where uh, three people collaborating does not equal um, the, the, the sum, but it equals much more. And so graduate teaching assistants, for, just for an example, are still learning, but they are, um, when they are asked to contribute, to actually contribute to a course, uh, you'll often find that they can contribute much more than a uh, lecturer or a professor expected. This, of course, will not always come as easy as it can because, uh, say, a uh, graduate teaching assistant making edits to a professor can come as odd at first, but eventually it leads to, to great result, results. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, <laughs> if you just. So it comes down to the Hollywood quote, nobody's perfect from the Sun Like It Hot movie from the <laughs> mid 20th century. Now, great little coding experience. We have resources, languages, very job and, and jobs. Let's, let's look uh, at each of these. So resources, so resources are extremely accessible for programming, for open access, um, open access language, uh, excuse me, open source languages such as R. So uh, the accessibility is, is vast and, and affordable as long as you have time for it, which is not free, but at least you only need time. So that, that's all you need. Um, and that's, that's a great advancement over previous paradigms. Languages are transferable. So when someone learns R, for a variety of reasons, they get, they get an invitation an, an intrinsic invitation to learn other languages. First, because the languages are embedded in R, particularly in R Studio, with version control Git, with uh, the part of all these shiny applications, data dashboards, etc., which embed HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's because it's embedded. And furthermore, because learning the paradigm of programming gives you already a, a stepping stone into programming in other languages to some to some degree, of course, but still uh, high transferability. Then it makes for a very job. So, and this is something many people really like. So, the, as you will know, the experience of hardcore researching based on reading uh, in the library is very different from the experience of coding. And this is nice because most usually, minds seek some novelty and get tired of doing always the same. So if you combine a bit of R and a bit of um, library kind of research, it, it's, a, it's a nice thing. It's something that many people like. 
And then jobs. Uh, Andrew referred to it, employability is an important thing, uh, let's face it. Uh, and so um, both because many people will, many students will work outside of their fields. And even if they do, um, R is highly valued. So, uh, well, R, R in this case or any programming language is highly valued both in academia and outside of it. So I think these are all reasons for integrating programming in curricula. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you very much, Phil. So the plan now is to split into groups. I'm going to create some breakout rooms. And I want each of the rooms to think of these two uh, questions. So I want you to think of the challenges you might face in your own area, trying to open research and reproducibility practices to the undergraduate and postgraduate taught curriculum. And I also want you to think of ways in which you might overcome these challenges. And I've created a little HackMD document, which you can sort of copy from here. I'll send the link out on the chat in a second. Um, and over the next, what, uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, if you in your groups would like to create or contribute to the HackMD document with your ideas about both of these sorts of things, um, and then yeah, we'll be we'll be going from room to room, uh, and then maybe we'll have a little report back at the end if we've got time. So please feel free to contact any of us. Uh, here are our GitHub, Twitter, and email addresses. Um, I'm going to try to create the breakout rooms. I will first. Tap the link to where's the chat? Uh, the HackMD document for you, it's, and it should be set up for everybody to edit. So I'm just going to create the breakout rooms now, and I will see you all back here in about 20 minutes or so. And I'm just going to do the breakout rooms, going to create four breakout rooms. No, I'm going to do five breakout rooms, and I'm just going to do the assignment automatically. So I will uh, see you all back here in 20 minutes or so. Everybody generally okay? Thumbs up if that's okay? Yep. Okay. So that, that's really, really... Great. Does anybody have any anything they want to say in particular? Anything that wasn't wasn't covered or doesn't look as if covered in this document? Any any secrets that people have that think you know here's something that worked when I had to do this at my own university? No. Just just the negative experience of we've definitely talked about this at staff level, and it all happens. Talk about it and because of the lack of a yeah. champion. And past champions have been beaten back by institutional lethargy. Yeah. I mean, you this might, is what, sorry, Emma. You might get your students involved. So yeah. we've met, I've, the chemistry department uh, quite closely allied to the biology department and our, their chemistry students were being told by biology students that they were getting taught R and <laughs> from the first year. And the, the, the student body actually said, why aren't we getting this important <laughs> coding skill? That's a great idea. Yeah. Students hate to think they're being taught something dated. Mm, yes. So if you tell them you're teaching them the new way of doing it rather than the old way you've taught for 30 years, that goes down well with students, I find. I think that's absolutely key. Um, and it's worth thinking that, you know, a lot of um, high school students now are actually learning um, Python uh, in high school. And, you know, to think that we're taking these students and then showing them in a certain graph pad or something in a few years time you know their their expectations are going to be higher i'm just aware now we're about one minute over time um so hopefully uh you find that interesting i thought it was really interesting listening to people's conversations seeing what's been added to the form and i think uh we need to leave this now so you've got a 10 minute or so break uh before the next session starts thank you very much very much yeah 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 thanks uh, i'll see, see you all on the other side Thanks, Andrew. Yep.